Good morning to everybody. Very delighted to be here to join you for this inaugural GovTech Stack Developer Conference. We have here more than 1,000 developers, designers, and product leaders from all over the world, both public and private sectors present with us. It's the first time we're having such a large gathering of the tech community in Singapore. Many of you would already be familiar with the Singapore government or have worked with us in some capacity because this government was an early starter in adopting IT. We were one of the first governments in the world to computerize, to digitize our data, and to move our services online. We did this to improve public services and to serve the needs of Singaporeans and businesses. And overall, we've not done too badly in this effort. Whether you're applying for a passport, or paying your taxes, or managing your HDB housing mortgage, or your CPF retirement savings, our services are efficient, convenient, and popular with citizens. We were also one of the first cities in the world to implement electronic road pricing. This is a, an effective and, dare I say, transformational use of technology, although, alas, not so popular with drivers. Our ambition now is to become a smart nation, using technology to better meet our people's needs for the future and to improve their lives. Many countries, many cities have similar ambitions to be smart nations or smart cities. Estonia, for example, but New York, Sao Paulo, Shanghai. First world or third, everybody has captured the buzzword. But each city has different needs, and we each have to develop it in our own way. The vision is vast, but we're working on several specific strategic projects to focus our efforts like a national sensor platform, a national digital identity, and urban mobility. One of these projects is to re-engineer our government. And we have a lot of work to do on this front, and let me explain why. Firstly, because we were early adopters of technology, so we now have many legacy IT systems built up over the years in different government agencies. And these enterprise IT systems have to be maintained and upgraded. As technologies advance, as policies change, systems must be modified, built upon, brought up to date, fixed. And this is an endless task. You could even say it's a Sisyphean task. You think you've completed rolling the stone up the hill, it comes down again and you start again. Over time, the modifications and the fixes accumulate and the whole structure becomes harder and harder to maintain. And at some point, the incremental changes are no longer adequate, and we have to consider radically overhauling the existing systems or replacing them together. And it's a long process. For example, in some corners of our government, we still have code that is written in COBOL. And we still have PCs which use Windows 98 because the old applications were written for that platform. I won't tell you where they are, but I did find out. <laughs> Second, we must apply new technologies and develop solutions to new problems. And these need not be grand enterprise system projects. They can be small applications or programs that improve government services and the citizen experience. For example, last year we launched an app for car parking called Parking.sg. And with this app, at last, motorists can dispense with the paper parking coupons which we have used for 40 years. And they can pay for exactly as long as they park. If you park for 18 minutes, you pay for 18 minutes. And if you find that you need to park for a little longer, you can extend your session remotely and you don't have to rush back to your car to tear and add another coupon before the parking lady comes. With technology, we can go beyond tweaking existing ways of doing things to reduce bureaucracy and simplify our processes significantly. For example, the Housing Development Board launched a resale portal for buying and selling 
HDB flats, which drastically simplified the paperwork and verification procedures. So the transaction time has been halved from 16 weeks to eight weeks, and buyers and sellers now need only visit HDB once instead of twice to complete a transaction. And most of the time you can dispense with a separate formal valuation of the property because there's enough indicators and comparators and the system knows whether your price is credible or not. Often the technology for these applications is not complex, but the re-engineering and redesign of processes requires a lot more work and a deep understanding of the end user's perspective and psychology, as well as organizational dynamics and organizational change. How do I get the change accepted, buy-in, implemented, and then replacing the old ones? We need to know also from the user's point of view, what is it, what problem are we solving? what he wants to do, what his pain points are, how he prefers to perform his transaction, what sort of difficulties he's likely to run into. And addressing these specific needs is how we use IT to deliver value to citizens. For example, we've developed a set of apps and web services called Moments of Life. These deliver a bundle of digital services to the citizen when he needs them most, during key events in their lives, like registering the birth of a child, searching for preschools, or managing the passing of a family member. Events that are not daily occurrences, but significant milestones and transitions, sometimes exciting, sometimes sorrowful, often stressful, and part of the stress is dealing with the bureaucracy. And moments of life will help smooth that process. So the aim is not just to save the citizens a lot of time running around from one department to another and dealing with multiple government agencies, but to reduce the worry and the stress. Thirdly, we have to revamp our existing IT infrastructure in order to fully exploit the potential of new technology. In particular, we have to learn to, how to take maximum advantage of cloud technology. Putting systems and services on the cloud brings many benefits. Developers have access to more toolkits and better software services. They can upgrade and improve the systems more easily. Operating and maintenance costs can be much lower, sometimes by orders of magnitude. And we can scale up and down our services easily and quickly by sharing computing resources. And we can run systems 24-7 without having to provide for expensive dedicated backups and hot standbys. Today, nearly all government IT systems are located on-premise. We are this way because we built, at the time when we built these systems, cloud technology didn't even exist. But for many government systems, cloud technology is now a viable and often will be an attractive option. Many private sector firms are moving their systems onto the cloud, and some have become totally reliant on it. For a government, security and data protection will be major considerations in using the cloud. But even companies with stringent security and privacy requirements like the financial institutions are using the cloud extensively. So the question for the government is not whether we do it, but to what extent we can use the cloud and how we can overcome the problems and minimize the risks. We have to decide which government systems can use commercial cloud services and which cannot. And for systems that cannot go on the commercial cloud, we have to design and build our own government cloud so that at least these systems can share the government cloud infrastructure and benefit from its efficiencies and economies of scale. And finally, for those systems that are so sensitive or critical that they must be isolated, have air gaps and guarded rooms and Faraday cages, we have to figure out how to develop and operate them in a future where everything else is on the cloud and all your engineers and technical people are working on the cloud, use the tools, and you put them in a room and say, write your subroutines, 
and they may well freak out. We've done a preliminary study and concluded that many government systems can, in principle, in principle exist on the commercial cloud. And over the next few years, we will begin to migrate systems onto the cloud, gain experience in this new mode of operation, and take bolder steps in the light of what we learn. And that brings me to the question of cybersecurity. It's a vital prerequisite for us to benefit from new technology in a more connected world. Recently, our Singh Health IT system was hacked. One and a half million outpatient medication records and personal records were stolen, including mine. It was a harsh reminder that cyberspace is not a benign environment and we have to do much better in keeping our IT systems and data safe and secure. The attacker was sophisticated, well-resourced, and determined, probably a state actor. But this case has also revealed internal weaknesses and lapses in our IT systems and organizations. We have to improve these and put them right. We have to train up our people, institute robust processes, inculcate the right mindsets, and enforce accountability. In fact, we started doing this several years ago, especially after the anonymous group, you know, that people with a Guy Fawkes icon, launched a DDoS attack on Singapore in 2013, specifically on the Singapore government. Notably, after that, we set up the Cybersecurity Authority of Singapore to lead our efforts across the entire public and private sectors to tighten up and bring our cybersecurity up to scratch. This latest Singtel, Sing Health incident only drives us to redouble our efforts. We must be alert to detect intrusions, respond decisively, recover quickly. Cybersecurity is a long and unending journey. Our cyber defenses will never be absolutely impregnable against those who wish us harm. And we must continually strike the right balance between security and usability. But there are many things we can do to tighten processes and to fix weaknesses without affecting the user experience. And that it is the responsibility of the agencies, the service providers, the CSA, the professionals to do, and the responsibility of the government to oversee them and make sure it's done. Finally, we will fundamentally transform how we develop government software and applications. A generation ago, it took a brilliant programmer working for Atari to build Pong, the arcade video game. I think most of you are probably too young to have played the original version, but you will have seen some emulation of it still available on the net. And this programmer, Alan Alcorn, had to build everything starting from scratch. Today, one engineer can create a hugely sophisticated, sophisticated game with fabulous CGI in just a few days of effort. Not because today's engineers are cleverer than the guy who built Pong, but because he has much better tools and he's able to exploit all the work done by generations of engineers and developers over the last decades. Graphics packages, physics packages, rendering routines, AI packages, game engines. Millions of lines of code hiding behind APIs. And he can build on all that that has already been done before, and he doesn't have to reinvent the wheel again. He doesn't need to understand the insides of all the software packages that he relies on, but he can build something new using them, and later on, perhaps others will use what he has done and take it to yet another level. And that is what we must do for the government as well. Take, for example, our government websites. We have hundreds of them. Needless to say, their quality varies. Instead of every agency building their own bespoke website at great expense and often repeating the same coding errors and bugs, we can do it more efficiently and get better results by reusing technologies. Or instead of every regulatory agency having its own online licensing processes or web forms, 
we can set up one central system that agencies can, adopt for their, can adapt for their use. Forms can be pre-filled with information, and users then do not need to repeatedly give government data that the government already has. And this is why we are building the Singapore Government Technology Stack, SGTS, the theme for today's conference. The SGTS is a suite of common software components used in application development. It comprises three standardized layers between the data and the application. First, common hosting platforms, like Amazon Web Services, so that all the agencies use the same set of tools and the same programming language. Second, shared middleware, such as centralized API gateways and an automated solution for testing web and mobile applications. And third, a library of commonly used microservices, such as payment and authentication, so that application developers can just plug and play. The SGTS will help us to deliver better public services to citizens through reusable software much faster and at a fraction of the cost. It will complement our greater use of the commercial cloud and support our efforts to share data more easily through published APIs. And together, SGTS, cloud and data will enable us to re-engineer the government's digital infrastructure. This will form the DevOps and digital environment for in-house engineers and users, and will also enable greater collaboration and exchange with the private sector. To drive our digital transformation, the government has to develop strong engineering capabilities and to nurture a deep engineering culture. And this entails building organizations that invest in and build up our people to provide them with the right skills, experience, and perspectives, and to empower them to make a difference. We recently created several new organizations to drive these efforts. The Smart Nation and Digital Government Group, SNDGG, <laughs> one of these words with no vowels, <laughs> along with GovTech, both under the Prime Minister's office, the Cybersecurity Authority of Singapore, and the Infocom Media Development Authority, IMDA. We also set up the Hive, as a center of excellence within GovTech. We must develop IT capability, not just with centralized agencies like these, but also in all our ministries and agencies. Because IT cannot be an afterthought or an add-on that is grafted onto an organization. It must be intrinsically part of what the organizations do. Even if the organization's main mission is something different, but something which has to use IT to succeed. Agencies must understand what technology can do for them in their mission areas, how to apply technical and engineering solutions to enhance their capabilities. They have to be informed consumers, able to write their own operational requirements and to make, and to make intelligent procurement and development decisions. They cannot be totally dependent on and hence at the mercy of outside consultants. And this is so whether you are the Ministry of Home Affairs in charge of police and civil defense and public security, whether you are the Land Transport Authority in charge of the public transport system and the road network, whether you are the Ministry of Health responsible for delivering health care and managing patients' records and data, whether you are Housing Development Board administering one million households in Singapore, each one having his HDB flat as his, one of his most important assets. Without IT, they will all fall down on their job. So developing an organizational IT capability in the center and in all these agencies requires expertise and talent at all levels. Teams with deep technical skills like cloud solution architects, cybersecurity specialists, UX designers. You need mid to senior level engineering leaders whom younger engineers can look up to and learn from. You need seasoned senior engineering leaders who have spearheaded major IT projects, 
who can make strategic engineering decisions and judgments and will supervise and mentor the next generation of talent. And we also need the top leadership in the public service, our permanent secretaries, our CEOs of our statutory boards, to be tech savvy or at least tech informed because they have to make the final decisions on IT projects. They need a feel. What is this about? Does it sound right? Is this the right order of magnitude? Am I solving the right problem? Am I paying 10 times too much for the job? And if they can't feel that, but must depend on somebody else to tell them that, then I think we are in a much weaker position. With senior engineering leaders and support from the top leadership, we can grow a strong engineering culture in, over time and integrate this constellation of talent into a real significant, formidable IT capability. And this is the sort of organization and working environment that ambitious, talented, and enterprising engineers and IT professionals look for. Remuneration is important. We've recently revamped our salary schemes to pay our officers competitively. And for exceptional talent, we can even pay for person. There are some further adjustments which we are making, but we have made substantial changes already. But even more important than competitive salary are the intangible factors. Being given challenging responsibilities and big problems to solve, being provided support and resources, being empowered to make decisions. Talented people want to be deployed to the best teams, to work under able leadership, to see their efforts lead to results. They want to change the world. And why not? To recruit the best, we have to offer the organization, the culture, the leadership, where talent can find growth opportunities, deepen their expertise, and make progress in their careers. And if we are successful, then we'll be able to attract and recruit engineers of the caliber that companies like Google, Netflix, Dropbox, Slack, and Gojek hire, whether fresh out of the university or already mid-career. We want talented IT professionals to consider the government as an employer, just as seriously as they would any of these companies. We've made some progress on this. At the Hive, we now have a team of close to 300 talented engineers, but we need many more, not just for GovTech, but also for CSA, for IMDA, and many other places in the government. Some of these people will work for a few years with us and flow out to the private sector or even to Silicon Valley because that's the quality we are aiming for. We can accept this provided we have a similar flow of talent into the government as well because then we can maintain an equilibrium and that will show that we are competitive and that people come to us because they are able to do great things with us. Of course, the government's efforts to develop our tech capability do not happen in isolation. They support our larger plans to build up the tech scene in Singapore as one pillar of our economy. We aim to grow a vibrant IT industry. Our universities are producing more good IT graduates because students have started to realize that IT skills are in demand. So all of a sudden, cutoff scores for getting into IT courses at the university have gone up. You now need three A's. We attract IT talent from the region to work here. We keep, it, we keep in touch with Singaporeans working in Silicon Valley and other tech centers around the world, and we try to bring some of them home. We welcome IT companies from startups to established players to set up shop here. Many are here already, Google, Facebook, Salesforce, Grab, Stripe, and they are growing. They are doing not just project management or marketing operations, but increasingly engineering work. And such a vibrant industry will provide the matrix within which the government can build its own capabilities and meet its IT needs and lead the smart nation efforts. So there are exciting developments in Singapore in the IT industry, both in the public and the private sectors. We don't know if all the initiatives will go as we plan, 
but as one GovTech officer said to me recently, we are rebuilding the aeroplane even as it is mid-flight. So it's a challenge, but if you are game for this challenge, please join us as we strive towards becoming a lean, agile and digital government and a smart nation. Thank you very much.